you have your Bibles, let's move right in to the Word of God today. If you have your Bibles, you join in Romans chapter 8, very well known chapter. Beginning at verse 31, let's read today through verse 39. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 31, reading through verse 39. And the word of the Lord reads this way from the King James text. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Hallelujah. I want to talk to us for a while today, if I may, on the topic had it not been, had it not been, if you bow your heads with me one more moment, Master, once again, we bow our heads humbly in your presence, thankful for the presence of the Holy Ghost, thankful for the touch of the Spirit of God that encourages our hearts. Reminding us that no matter how difficult the journey, no matter how trial wrought our walk in this life, one day, as the old song says, I'm going to meet him at the gate when trials are past. I'm going to see him face to face in glory at last. I believe that when we meet, well done, he will say. Oh, Master, how I look forward to the day. And Lord, how I struggle day by day to make certain that I hear those words. The preacher needs the anointing or else he is worthless to the people of God. Touch my heart, my spirit, my tongue. Let every word that I utter be inspired of the Holy Ghost, that the people of God might be blessed, encouraged, uplifted thereby. For we ask it today in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You know, I have to tell you, since I am new to 
Nashville, and since Nashville is new to me, it is incumbent upon me to help those of you folks who are from Nashville to understand that the ministry God has given me today is very, very, very different than the ministry I knew many years ago. Some years back, I don't know how many years ago it's been now, but it's been quite a few. I had a dream one night. And in my dream, I had a dove as a pet. Now, I used to own a dove many years ago. And I, I named the dove paraclete, which is the... Uh, Greek word that is translated comforter, you know, paraclete. So I called my dove paraclete. And that dove could make so much racket. At night, you would put a cover over its cage, and it would just sit in that cage and coo and coo all night. You could just hear it making all this noise. I love that bird. Oh, I love that bird. And in my dream, I had a dove much like Paraclete, but it was pure white. Paraclete was white. And in my dream, I would hold that dove on my finger, and I would talk to it. And as I talked to it, its little head would tilt and turn as if it understood every word I was saying. And in my dream, I came out into a another room in the apartment or whatever I was in, house, apartment, whatever it was. It was not what I recognized. And I noticed that my window was wide open and my dove was missing. And I ran outside and there was kind of a courtyard, a garden area. I ran outside into this courtyard and I was looking everywhere for my dove. I didn't want to lose my dove. I wanted to make sure that my baby came home. And I was calling for it and I was holding up my finger. And finally, off in the distance, I could see Paraclete, my white dove. I could see it descending from the sky. And I was so thrilled. I was so happy. I said, oh, my baby, my dove is coming home to me. And as it approached my finger and as it landed on my finger, suddenly it changed. And no longer was it this beautiful white dove. Now it was a black bird. A beautiful bird. It was a beautiful bird. And the feathers were so iridescent with color. It's like even though it was black, the feathers reflected a variety of different colors, you know. And I'm looking at this bird and I'm thinking, well, this isn't my dove. This isn't up there. It looked like my dove. But now that it's back on my finger, this isn't the same bird that I was looking for and calling for. And all of a sudden, I noticed this bird's head beginning to turn. And he's looking. And he was doing everything exactly the way that my white dove used to do. So I began to talk to him. And it began to tilt its hand, and it did exactly what the other bird. And I realized, I said, it looks different, but it's the same bird. Well, I couldn't understand that dream. I woke up, I could not, I kept thinking about that day. I think I even told Tommy about it. And I said, I had the strangest dream. And I told him about it. I said, for the life of me, I cannot understand what that dream was supposed to mean, what it was supposed to signify. And after maybe a couple of days, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm going to tell you what that dream meant it was a message for your spirit I was sending you a message I'm trying to help you understand that your ministry is going to go through something of a transformation it's not going to look 
the same as it used to look, but it's still going to be beautiful, and it's still going to be your ministry. Hallelujah. Oh, not everything will change, but there will be changes that take place. There are a lot of people in the affirming Pentecostal spirit-filled movement who play this game where they try so hard to look like the mainstream church. And the preacher gets in the pulpit and he tries to preach as close a message to what you would hear in the mainstream church as he possibly can. But of course, there is this one issue that they have to approach differently. And that is the issue of LGBT believers. And so all of a sudden, they differ from the mainstream church only in their interpretation only in their understanding of this one specific issue. Can LGBT people be Christians? Can they serve God? Can they live for the Lord? Well, I'm going to tell you a little secret about this preacher's ministry. It don't look like that. It still don't look like the white dove that it used to be. No, it looks different. It looks very different. I'm going to tell you something. You come into this church. I'm, I'm, I'm going to challenge you now. I'm going to tell you a little secret. If you're a person who comes from a Pentecostal apostolic background, this church is going to challenge the fire out of you. I am going to challenge you like you ain't never been challenged in your life. And is it okay if I just say plainly and clearly why? I'll tell you why. Because those of us, myself included, who were born and raised in a mainstream Pentecostal environment, whether we want to recognize it or not, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, whether we're willing to see it or not, the truth is we were brought up in a works-based salvation message. Your salvation rests entirely not not mostly, not partly. It rests entirely upon you. We used to sing songs talking about how we're trying to make heaven. Am I telling the truth? We're trying to get in. We're trying to do the best we can so that we can be included in the rapture, so that we can be included in God's heaven. Even the songs we sang, some of doctrine that is contrary to the word of God. My friend, I wish I could wake you up and shake you up and make you realize your salvation is not on you. It's on him. Hallelujah. He did it. So you don't have to. But more than that, he did it because you can't. The word of God says, for what the law could not do, could not do, could not do. Didn't say what the law didn't do. Said what the law could not do. In that it was weak through the flesh. What does that mean? 
it means that the law was incapable of saving anybody. Why? Because the law was dependent upon our ability to uphold it. Mm -hmm. Paul said, you might as well know this now, there is no flesh that shall be justified by the law. And then what he said, he said no flesh is justified by the law. He said, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, condemned sin, not the sinner, condemned sin in the flesh. Folks, I got news for you. This ministry starts out with one important premise. And that premise is this. The mainstream church from First Baptist to First United Pentecostal has gotten one major truth of the Word of God wrong, 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 wrong. When I first came out in 1989, I was decided I was going to live honestly. I wasn't going to try to fight my internal identification any longer. I knew I was gay. I knew that. I didn't act on it before this. I promise you that. I didn't act on it. But I knew internally. And according to my Bible, whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Got news for you, honey. If you're sitting around thinking in your head and in your heart that you have desires for men, it don't matter whether you act on it or not, you're gay. Because that's what the Word of God tells me. What you feel, what you think in your heart, So you can sit there and lie to yourself all you want to. But the reality is your heart betrays you. And while man looketh upon the outward appearance, guess where God's looking? On the heart. Mm -hmm. So if as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And if God looks at the heart, then sweetheart, you can try to lie to God about who you are until the cows come home. He is not fooled. Now I'm not trying to speak condemnation down on anybody. That's not why I said that. But I'm going to tell you, I get sick and tired of these closeted preachers preaching against queers. When they themselves are as queer as the three dollar bill, and they good and bloody well know it. Mm. I get tired of that foolishness. I know a preacher, personally, who is closeted, but he has told me flat out that he is a member of the LGBT community. And yet I would watch him posting stuff on Facebook and stuff on social media that was anti-LGBT. He was trying to post all this hyper-conservative crapola. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking and I'm saying, boy, who do you think you're fooling? Who do you think? You know, obviously you think you're fooling everybody on Facebook. The only problem is the one you need to be concerned with, you ain't fooling at all. But when I first came out in 89, decided that I just couldn't fight it, I just couldn't keep playing this game. I was lonely, I was depressed, I was miserable all the time. I was suffering, I was struggling. You know how it is. Most of us have been through it. And the first time that I walked into an LGBT establishment was a club in New Haven, Connecticut. It's not there any longer. I wish it was. It used to be a pretty neat place. It was called the Copa, Copa Cabana. 
And uh, I had never been in an LGBT establishment in my life. I had no idea what it was going to be like. I had, no, I had all kinds of thoughts in my head based on what I had heard preachers say, you know. I had all these thoughts, people were going to be groping me and people were going to be molesting me and I was afraid going in because that's how they preach, you know, that after all, gay people are just a bunch of perverts and, and the uh, gay establishments, all they do is feel up on each other and touch up on each other and, and pervert each other, you know, and that's such garbage. We know it's garbage, but that's what you hear. So I didn't know going in what it was going to be like, you know. But as I was walking in, I had just left the church behind, not but a few weeks before. I was still fresh out of church. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me just as plain as day. And He said to me, you can help these people. And I said, how? How can I help? these people. And I understood he meant LGBT people, you know. I said, how can I help LGBT? What are you talking about? And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, you can help them to understand that my grace is sufficient for them too. And I answered, I said, Lord, I no, no, I could not help them understand that. Why? Well, Lord, because even I don't believe that. See, I've been raised in the church, told me, if you were going to be saved, you had to be just a certain way. If you were going to make heaven, it was entirely dependent, listen to me now, entirely dependent on your ability to be something they said you had to be or to do something they said you had to do. And if you couldn't do it or if you couldn't be it, then there was no way on earth you could be saved. Because even though the grace of God applies to all of these sinners sitting in the pew, Because they got news for you. There's not one perfect man sitting on any pew in any church anywhere. That's right. Yes, Your sin may be different than mine, but you've got it. Your sin may be hidden, it may be concealed, yes, but you've got it. You may be fooling everybody in the church. You may have the pastor fooled. You may have the elders fooled. You may have the deacons fooled. Oh, honey, you may have the whole church of God fooled. The only problem is you haven't got the God of the church fooled. And you're a fool if you think you can fool God. took me over three years before the Lord was able to bring me back to the church. When he brought me back, finally, and I began, I said, Lord, okay, I need to understand these issues related to LGBT people and, and, and the church and the faith. I said, I need to understand these issues. Where do I begin? And I thought, well, should I begin in Genesis 19, the story of Sodom? Should I begin in Romans 1? Should I begin in Deuteronomy or Leviticus? Where should I begin? And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, no, don't begin at any of those passages. He said, you need to begin with a subject, not a passage. And I said, well, Lord, what subject then should I begin with? And he came back to me just as clear and crisp as he could. He said, you need to start with the issue of grace. 
You need to go through the entire Word of God and you need to see what I say about grace. What is grace? What is the work of grace? How does grace work? So I spent months combing through the Word of God. I looked at every single passage in the Bible, every one that had the word grace in it. I looked at how it was used. I looked at what it was saying about grace. I looked at how grace was described as working. And brother, I found that the definition and the understanding of grace that we had in the full gospel, spirit-filled Pentecostal apostolic churches was so polluted and so diluted, it wasn't even funny. I found that we sang the amazing grace, how sweet the sound, and we had no idea what grace was. was taught as the means whereby God brought us the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, the gospel comes to us by grace. But then once we come down to the altar and we repent and turn our back on sin and we begin to walk a life of faith and belief, and confidence in God, all of a sudden, the minute we got up from that altar, everything changed. Because now it was, okay, now you believe the gospel, you've repented, you've been baptized, you've received the Holy Ghost, but now you have to do this, 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 you have to wear this, you can't wear that. You have to go here, you can't go there. You have to do this, you have to. And there was a list of my own. And all of a sudden we go from grace to works. All of a sudden, if I'm going to make heaven, I've got to work my way in. Because if I don't look just right, if I don't act just right, if I don't do just right, if I don't talk just right, then the trouble will blow and I'm going to miss. And according to the doctrine I was taught as a kid, if you so much as stubbed your toe and cussed, God help you if the trumpet blows five minutes later because, honey, you're going to miss it. And I tell the truth. Well, I got news for you. That is not the foolhardy, stupid, nonsensical, unbiblical doctrine you will hear preached from this church. We are an affirming church because we are a progressive church. We are a progressive church because we have moved past and we have moved beyond the errors of the past. Mm -hmm. And the errors of the past are not only are not only found in the interpretation and understanding of certain passages of Scripture as they relate to LGBT people. Oh, no, 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 no. There are much bigger errors in the church than that. Honey, the biggest error is in their understanding and application of grace. Well, I got news for you. Forward Christian Life Center teaches, preaches, and believes that grace applies to everybody. Hallelujah. It doesn't just apply to some, it applies to everybody. And let me tell you, grace will get you into glory because works can't. Hallelujah. Grace will get you into heaven because your efforts cannot do it. Try as you might. The Word of God says, even our righteousness, even, listen, all our righteousness, 
righteousness. All our righteousness is the form of the Lord as filthy rags. How can you be so ignorant and foolish as to believe that somehow the way you wear your hair, somehow the length you wear your skirt, somehow the way you dress or where you go or what you do is going to get you into heaven when all our righteousness is before the Lord as filthy rags. Sweetheart, you can take the most godly, righteous, holy man among us and stand him before the presence of a holy God and he will fall like Isaiah to his knees and declare, I'm an unclean man with unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Hallelujah. Oh my Lord, have mercy. Oh, I'll tell you, there is a, an arrogance in self-righteousness. You see, the message that we preach requires that you understand the role of humility. See, when you're humble, the Word of God said, Let not a man think more highly of himself than he ought. When you're humble, you don't think of yourself in terms that are unrealistic. Oh, oh, oh. You don't think of yourself in unrealistic terms. I'm going to tell you something. I'd be a fool. If I ran around trying to project that I'm perfect and I'm sinless and I do everything right and I don't never do anything wrong, I'd be lying to you, I'd be lying to God, I'd be lying to everybody, and I know it. But there's an old saying my grandmother used to have when I was a kid. She always would say, but for the grace of God, oh hallelujah, Thank God for His grace. Because God's grace, my friend, does not bring you to the altar of repentance and then abandon you there so you can work your way into heaven. No, that's not how this thing works. No, God's grace will bring you to the altar. And once you get to that altar, you're married to grace. Hallelujah. And grace will never leave you. And if it ever does, you'll never make heaven. Because the only way you're going to make it is by grace. Mm -hmm. Not only will grace get you to the altar, those of you watching me online, it'll get you in through the pearly gate. Hallelujah. It's not just there to get you to repent. It's there to get you to heaven. Hallelujah. Grace is God's answer to sin. He gives us favor that we don't deserve. But listen to me. He had to have cause. He had to have a reason to be able to impart unto us grace. Favor that we have not earned. Favor that we do not deserve. So what he did is he sent Jesus. Jesus went to the cross. Hallelujah. Jesus went to the grave. Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus ascended into heaven. Jesus descended as the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. And my Bible said that same Spirit that dwelt within Christ, that raised Him up from the dead, dwells in you also. Hallelujah. And that same Spirit that raised Him up is going to raise you up. Hallelujah to God. I got news for you today, children. God is able to impart His grace unto us. What does the Word of God say? For by grace are ye saved. How? Through faith. 
See, God needed something. All I need is an opening so that I can show these people unmerited, unearned favor. All I need is a little opening. So what is the opening? If they will just believe and obey my gospel. Oh, hallelujah. If they'll just believe and obey the gospel, that's all the opening I need to be able to extend to them open-ended grace. And that grace isn't there just to get them to the altar. No, no, no. It's there to get them all the way in through the pearly gates. Hallelujah. The Word of God declares in our primary text today, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Do you know what most Christians in the church world today do not understand? And I'm here to declare it in your hearing as plainly as I possibly can make it. God is on your side. God wants you to win. God wants you in heaven. There isn't anything in God that wants you to lose out and miss heaven. No, He is for you. Hallelujah. He is That's not the way I grew up. No, he was there to impart judgment, to criticize, to find fault, to condemn every time we misspoke, every time we misstep, every time we trip, every time we fall. According to the preachers I grew up under, he was there ready to beat us down and punish us for having done wrong. And I tell the truth today. But I'm here to tell you what the Apostle Paul told the church at Rome. If God be for us, who can be against us? Oh, hallelujah. Had it not been for the Lord on my side. Romans chapter 124. The word of the Lord reads today. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side. Now may Israel say. If it had not been the Lord. Who was on our side when men rose up against us? Then they had swallowed us up quick. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who hath not given us as a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Oh, children, had it not been for the Lord on our side, and if God be for us, who can be against us? Oh, hallelujah. Paul named all kinds of things that could be construed as obstacles to our salvation. And yet in the end, Paul said, I'm convinced that none of these things, oh glory to God, none of these things, none of these things can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. None of them! Not some of them! Not a few of them! He said none. 
up there. Why? Because God is on our side. Sweetheart, when you believed and obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you became his kid. When you become God's kid, he looks at you differently. Now, that doesn't mean sometimes your kids don't act just like the neighbor's kids. Sometimes they do. The only difference is, these are your kids. The neighbor can take care of his kids. These are my kids. You hear what I'm telling you now? I'm going to tell you something. Uh, people are much more patient. People are much more kind. People are able to be much more slow to act with their own children than they'd be willing to act with somebody else's. You go into the grocery store and you see a kid in a carriage and he's screaming and hollering because he wants that candy and his mother's trying to tell him no, you can't have that candy I don't want you to have, have that kid just screaming and hollering and I guarantee you how many of us look at that kid and we think, oh if you were mine oh kid, if you were my kid oh, oh. <laughs> your little honey be shining red right now Oh, it be glowing in the dark. I'd wear you out. You think you're going to act like that. But you know what's funny? Then you let that same person have a kid. Mm -hmm. And when their kid does that same exact thing, they become the mother who's standing there patiently saying, Now, Johnny, I told you I don't want you to have that. No, you can't have that right now. We've got to have dinner. You're not, do you follow what I'm telling you? Why? Because that's your kid. See, when you're looking at somebody else's kid and you have no investment in that child, you don't think anything of want them to swallow. But when you're looking at your own kid, all of a sudden you find patience you don't have for the other kid. Because there's love there that you don't feel for the other kid. I got news for you children. When you become a born again child of God, God looks at you through the eyes of love. And there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And because He loves at you, He looks at you with patience. He looks at you with mercy. He looks at you with grace. He is over to, He is able to overlook some of our indiscretion. He is able to overlook, yes, some of our sins. He is able to overlook many of our misdeeds and our miswords because He loves us and because we have given Him the opportunity to impart unto us grace. And how did we do that? Through faith and obedience to the gospel. So do you see, this church has a very different approach than a lot of churches. I'm not going to stand up here and preach people into hell. I'm going to cheer you into heaven. Hallelujah. I've had people ask me. I've had people ask me, well, you know, bless God, why don't you preach hell for our prayers? So why don't you preach against this and preach against that? And my answer is simple. I'm too busy trying to preach people into heaven and I don't have time to preach people out of hell. There's a difference. It's about the approach. I can either preach you out of hell or I can preach you into heaven. What I'd rather do is preach you into heaven than try to preach you out of hell. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I'm going to tell you a little secret. Ain't nobody going to be in the rapture. Who's looking to escape hell? Think of me, nobody makes heaven because they're afraid of hell. If the only reason you're in church today is because you're afraid of hell, I got news for you. You're going to go there and be like, oh, Pastor, I don't believe you said that. I'm telling the truth. I'm telling you, my Bible said, but the fearful and unbelieving shall have their part in the lake of fire. Am I telling the truth? The book of Revelation says the fearful and unbelieving. Honey, if you're so afraid of hell that you're trying to make heaven out of fear of hell, 
then you're not really believing God in faith. You're trying to believe God out of fear. Got news for you. Fear and faith are completely contradictory to one another. They have no relationship whatsoever. You cannot have fear and faith in the same room because they are completely the opposite one another. My Bible teaches me to make heaven, you've got to believe the gospel. Not be afraid of hell. You've got to believe the gospel. You've got to have faith, not fear. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I'm going to tell you something else that doesn't occupy the same room. And that is works and grace. The Apostle Paul said either it's works or it's grace. You can't have both. The both of them are contradictory to one another. If it's works, he said, then it's works. If it's grace, then it's grace. He said, you can't have both. It's impossible. There is no way in the world you can mix works and grace. But we have churches in America today by the millions that are preaching a message this morning that is exactly that. They're trying to mix works with grace. Yes, we're saved by grace. Thank you, Lord. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Now you clear. If you can't find God, if you can't get a hold of the Holy Ghost and straighten yourself up, you're going to miss heaven. What? Wait a minute, where did grace go? It was here a minute ago. Well, it ran out the room the minute you started preaching works because works and grace cannot occupy the same throne. My Lord have mercy. So see, I'm telling you, there will be some people who come from apostolic background who are going to come into this church and they're not going to be able to handle our theology because they're used to a works based. They call it holiness. Oh, brother, I believe in holiness. Hallelujah. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. What does holiness mean to you? Well, holiness, that's what the rules and regulations you got to follow so that you can stand before God holy. Uh, got news for you. There ain't never been enough rules and regulations written to make you stand before God holy. That's right. Because my Bible said even the law couldn't do it. And the law was over 500 rules and regulations. So you think your little 25 rules and regulations about hair, makeup, and jewelry is going to make you stand before God holy when over 500 laws couldn't do it? Mm -hmm. What's wrong with you, Dick Witt? What's wrong with you? If it had not been for the Lord, who was on our side? Ephesians 2, verse 3, 8 through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now listen to this next passage. This is where the church gets it all wrong. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. When you become a child of God at the altar of repentance, when you believe and obey this gospel and you become a child of God, listen, you become His project. For ye are His workmanship. You become His project. Listen, you better listen close to this. You're not your project. <laughs> You're his project. It's not your job to clean you up and straighten you up and get you where you need to be. It's his job to clean you up, straighten you up, and get you where you need to be. You are his workmanship. Oh, hallelujah. He is the potter. 
I eat the clay. I don't tell the potter what to do with the clay. The potter has full control. Hallelujah. Glory to God. As a child of God, I don't have to tell God what I have to do to be saved. I don't have to tell no. What I have to do to be saved is believe and obey the gospel. That's all I have to do to be saved. Mm -hmm. Now listen, there's a lot of things I can do to be a better testimony. There's a lot of things I can do to be a better witness. There's a lot of things I can do to be a more profitable servant. And I tell the truth. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean I'm going to miss heaven. Because I'm not perfect. No. The Word of God teaches that when the Lord returns, He says He will have His reward with Him. And He will reward every man according to their works. I was born and raised in a church that taught me that every little thing you said or did was heaven or hell. Guess what? That's wrong. If you believe and obey the gospel, you receive the Holy Ghost. My Bible tells me the Holy Ghost is the seal of our redemption. Isn't that what it teaches? Well, now how's God going to seal you to something and then somehow or another because you slip or you fall, you're going to miss heaven? No, you're sealed. There's an old song, Thank God I am sealed. Sealed. Unto the day of redemption. Oh, hallelujah. I'm sealed, brother. I'm sealed. Oh, hallelujah. God's on my side. I'm sealed. Now, I may get there. And I may have some things to answer for. I may get there. And I may lose out on some of my reward because I didn't do like I could have done. Like I should have done. the whole of Scripture instead of picking it to pieces and making it say something it doesn't. We are His workmanship. That means we are His project. When we reach the streets of glory, none shall declare if it hadn't been for my ability to straighten myself out. Or if it hadn't been for my ability to change myself. No. You'll never hear that. The only declaration any saint will make standing on the holy hills of heaven is this. If it had not been the Lord who was on my side. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. If it had not been. Praise God. Which is standing with me this afternoon. We need to